Look at this text. It's an ancient Egyptian medical text. It dealt mostly with women's health, such as gynecological diseases, pregnancy, and birth control. It was written around 1850 BC. And it shows that women have been ending pregnancy and using birth control for at least 4,000 years. And for most of those 4,000 years, this wasn't an issue in most places in the world. Governments rarely made it illegal, religions rarely made an issue out of it, and various books and pamphlets openly described all sorts of family planning procedures. Yet today, it's a highly divisive topic fought almost everywhere. So what happened? How did it go from everybody can use it when they want to, to having legislation regulating when, who and how you can use it? Well, in this video, we will look at all the way from ancient history to the 21st century, how reproduction rights have changed over time. We won't just look at the USA or Europe like so many people do. We will look at the entire world to see how laws changed in those areas and looking at specific countries from time to time in order to give specific examples. The topic of this video is rather controversial. We therefore need to avoid using certain words such as the one starting with a board and ending with ion. In this video, we will simply call it the procedure to keep the advertisers happy. There are many different methods of fertility control used throughout history. In Papua, women jumped from high objects such as rocks and trees. The Crow people of Sumatra places hot ashes on a woman's abdomen. Pima women in North America strain themselves. The Kagatla of South Africa bleed themselves with incisions or leeches. And don't worry, we won't show blood or anything like this. This video is family friendly. The Germans used a tea made of lavender, parsley, thyme, and marjoram. And the women of the Baholoholo people, okay, that name sounds awesome. Uh, and the women of the Baholoholo people would drink water mixed with iron sulfate from their smithies. All these methods would decrease the chances of a successful pregnancy. But that said, don't try this at home. Don't take any medical advice from a history YouTuber. For thousands of years, if you wanted to become a doctor in Europe, you had to abide by something called the Hippocratic Oath. It was written about 2,500 years ago. It has gone through many variations over the course of history, yet they all have some version of doing no harm to their patient. The earliest known version of the Hippocratic Oath reads, I will do no harm or injustice to my patients. Neither will I administer a poison to anyone when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. Similarly, I will not give a woman a pessary to end a pregnancy. Because of this oath, doctors were hesitant to end any pregnancy unless that pregnancy put the life of the mother in danger. Without a doctor to help them, they instead helped themselves. Gynecological texts had recipes for contraceptives and abortive suppositories. Wealthy women even had access to surgeries that would save her life if giving birth was too dangerous. Caesareans have been performed since antiquity, however, they were only performed after the mother passed away in order to at least save the life of the baby. Unlike what you might see in House of the Dragon, it wasn't performed on living women. In Christian societies, if the woman did not appear to be at risk from the pregnancy, then it was seen as immoral to end the pregnancy. Not because it might hurt the baby, but because these procedures were a danger to the woman. If she died from the procedure, then she technically ended her own life, and according to Christianity, this means your soul will go to hell. The issue was with her eternal soul. It was also believed that a man had the right to an heir and that a woman was supposed to do her duty by providing her husband with children. Women who ended their pregnancies would sometimes be punished for it, not because it was seen as murder, but because women were seen as birthing machines for their husbands. There are cases of women being executed for performing the procedure. But over in the Middle East, society and doctors were a lot more accepting of family planning options. Islamic texts don't specifically address the issue. As such, it was up to the individual doctor whether they would assist women in this matter. Look at these two books, The Canon of the Medicine and The Book of Healing, two medical encyclopedias. It was written by a Middle Eastern physician called Ibn Sina, who practiced medicine at the beginning of the 11th century. 
His work became standard medical text for medical universities in Africa, Europe, and Asia well into the 17th century. Ibn Sina, also known as Avicenna in the West, wrote a book describing 20 different methods of contraception in remarkably accurate and detailed manners. He prescribed these methods of contraception for medical reasons only. He was in no way concerned with the social or economic reasons for the practice of birth control even at the individual or family level. European medicine in the late Middle Ages inherited much of their knowledge and techniques regarding family planning from Arab physicians, who had fewer issues discussing the matter than doctors in the West. Among slaves, it was common to undertake the procedure. There were two main reasons for it. The first is that many of them didn't want to bear the child of their owners, and the second is that they didn't want their child to be born in slavery also. They used certain exercises, drank potions, and performed hard labor in order to prevent giving birth. And in many Western countries and their colonies, various methods of family planning were widely known to their people. For example, in 1844, the US Practical Receipt Book contained all sorts of recipes for food, household chemicals, and medicine, among them family planning remedies. Being a former British colony, they used British common law, meaning it was legal as long as the woman couldn't feel the baby move yet. But in the 19th century, this began to change. Chapter 1. Worldwide Criminalization In the 19th century, industrialization was in full swing across Europe and North America. Those new factories needed new workers, and many families moved from farms to live in the cities. Those farmers needed to have large families in order to have enough workers. Child labor was common at the time, but when people moved to the cities, these large families became a burden. Larger houses were more expensive, salaries were low, and there was less public space to use. And now that having too many children became a burden, women started advocating for voluntary motherhood. In it, women would be allowed to decide when to be intimate with their partner. As they saw it, a man does not have the right to a woman's body without her consent. By refusing intimacy when the chance of pregnancy was high, women had a greater control over when they would get pregnant. In the 1850s, Sarah Grimke argued for a right on the part of the woman to decide when she shall become a mother, how often, and under what circumstances. And childbirth was dangerous. Being pregnant is a threat to a woman's life. In the 1850s, a woman living in the Netherlands, for example, had a 5% chance to die per pregnancy. To give an example of this, my grandmother was pregnant 15 times. She had 13 children and two miscarriages. If she had lived in the 1800s, she would have had a 54% chance of dying from complications due to pregnancy. The fight to control pregnancy wasn't just about personal rights, it was also a matter of survival. I understand that in many countries, the biology concerning pregnancy is not taught properly. In fact, it's so bad that for this video, I specifically hired a woman because I don't trust my own education or the education of other male members of the team. And even she had to do research about pregnancy because even women aren't getting proper education in school. So let me explain why it's dangerous. The womb is located behind the intestines. When the baby gets bigger, the womb will squish those intestines to the sides. Around the 30 week mark, it also starts pushing the liver and stomach away. Eventually, the baby needs even more space and the lungs get squished up and forward a bit. Your heart is located between your lungs, so it gets pushed forward as well. Now, on top of your insides being rearranged, you also need to do hard, grueling labor in a factory or farming in the sun. Up at dawn, working all day long, wishing your pregnancy was gone. This can increase the health risk for both the mother and the child. And many women wanted to choose when to get pregnant so they could avoid this scenario by planning when to give birth. As more women chose to have fewer children, they had more time to spend on other things such as political activism, hobbies, or their careers. By the 1870s, family planning and undertaking the procedure was seen as a way to help women achieve goals in life that didn't include children. Because if women had to give birth most of their adult life, it would be very difficult for those women to develop in other ways. But women demanding rights was seen as a threat by a lot of men in Western societies. In the 19th century, the man was usually in charge of the household. Women weren't allowed to find a profession on their own, couldn't open a bank account without their husband's permission. 
and women didn't even have the right to vote, with the expectation that the man would vote for what is best for women, rather than women voting for what's best for women. And those women who were demanding equal rights, demanding to choose when to have children, and demanding when to be intimate with their partner made a lot of men very angry. Because this might mean the end of their position as head of a household. And these men formed a counter movement, which wanted to ban the procedure and various forms of family planning. In essence, the so-called pro-life movement started out as a bunch of men who were afraid they wouldn't get laid anymore and wanted to control women. Various groups began lobbying the government to make the practice illegal. Some argued that the procedure was simply too dangerous to give people access to unless their life was already in danger. Some just wanted to control women in a time where they demanded more rights, while others argued that even an unborn human is a person and therefore entitled to the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And over time, many women and feminists joined this movement as well. They instead advocated abstinence, that if you simply don't go to bed with someone, you won't get pregnant. Today we know this method doesn't work at all because most humans have certain urges. But in the 19th century it was believed that men were inherently sexual beings while women were inherently asexual beings. And that therefore women had no interest in being intimate and could just say no to their husband. The most interesting reason to make the procedure illegal however were doctors. Today if you go to for example a pharmacist then they are part of the same medical industry as a doctor. In the 19th century, however, doctors had competition from midwives, folk healers, and homeopathy. Doctors wanted to make the procedure illegal unless it was performed by a licensed physician. This way, they could cut out the competition and gain a monopoly on medicine. You need only look at the modern medical industry to see how effective such strategies were. By the early 20th century, the USA and every country in Europe had made the procedure illegal with minor exceptions such as being forced into intimacy, inbreeding, and when it threatened the woman's life. Most of these countries had colonies and spread this legislation there too. Africa, Asia, and the remaining colonies in the Americas each adopted the European and US legislations. Even Japan, which had never been colonized, made it illegal in 1869 and also forced this legislation onto its colonies as they conquered new territory. South America was the first to kick out the European overlords, but they were a very Christian region who believed that for a country to be strong, they needed more people, so they made it illegal there too. And by the beginning of the 20th century, the procedure was illegal almost everywhere in the world with a few minor exceptions. But today, that's not the case anymore. So what happened? Chapter 2. Europe. The first country to ever legalize the procedure was the Soviet Union in 1920 during a famine. The Soviets didn't want more mouths to feed, so if a woman decided she didn't want to watch her newborn starve, then she could go to a doctor to have the procedure done. But once the famine was over and Stalin needed more people to invade Europe, he made it illegal again in 1936. After Stalin died, they once again made it legal in 1955. And just to be clear, when we mean legalized, we mean that you can choose to have one without a specific medical reason. So if theoretically you just wanted to undergo the procedure without any particular reason, then you could just do it. You didn't need approval from a professional beforehand. The Soviet Union wanted to show to the world that they were a freedom-loving country. They wanted to show the world that while a country like the USA was still debating whether African Americans were human beings who deserved to sit in a bus, the Soviet Union was giving women the right to choose when to have children. Some of the other Soviet-style communist countries followed, such as Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania in 1956 and Czechoslovakia in 1957. And even after the Soviet Union broke apart, the countries kept it legal. From Kazakhstan to Georgia to the authoritarian dictatorship of Turkmenistan, it has remained legal. The only exception to this is Poland, where it's become more restrictive. Two years after the breakup of the USSR in 1993, they restricted the procedure and you could only get it for medical reasons or if the act was forced upon you. In 2020, they restricted it even more, only allowing it in life and death situations. For example, there is a condition called pregnancy myopia, where your eyesight gets significantly worse after you've had a baby. For some people, it can cause a degree of blindness. But being blind is not a life-threatening situation, so if you have a high risk of pregnancy, 
pregnancy myopia, then you still can't undergo the procedure in Poland. You just need to hope that after giving birth, you will still be able to see where you're going, that you can keep doing your job, or are able to read books. But outside the Soviet Union, liberalization started in Iceland in 1935, followed by Sweden in 38, Denmark in 39, Finland in 1950, Norway in 1960, and the UK in 1968. While they didn't make the procedure fully legal, they did start to allow it under certain circumstances. In Iceland, they took the mother's health into consideration and whether she'd be able to take care of the child after it's born. In Finland, it could be performed if the child was deformed or the act was non-consensual, but full legalization within any amount of time didn't exist. But this changed in 1975, when Austria allowed the procedure in the first 28 weeks. The same year in France, they allowed it within the first 10 weeks. You no longer needed to have a specific reason, you could simply go to a clinic if you wanted to. Other countries soon followed, West Germany in 1976, Yugoslavia in 77, Italy 78, and the Netherlands in 1981. And over time, European countries have become more liberal. Although that said, the legislation per country is slightly different and when you look up online when a country legalized the procedure, you will find they use different dates depending on which definition of legal they mean. So please keep that in mind. Over time, the European countries became more and more accepting of the procedure. An interesting case is Ireland. It used to have very strict laws. Some of the strictest in the world, in fact. It was a British colony and was forced to adopt British common law in 1861, which prohibited the procedure and over time added various extra laws to make the procedure more and more illegal. But people still had the procedure by going abroad. In fact, 150,000 women got the procedure done abroad in 1980 alone. In Ireland, they mainly use referendums to change the law. In 1983, they passed a law through a referendum, which gave equal rights to the mother and the unborn child. Then, years later, when a woman became pregnant and had cancer, she was denied treatment because that could potentially harm the child. And that would mean the doctors would break the law. The child still died at birth and the mother three days later. In 1992, a teenager was abused. When they found out she was pregnant, the family decided to have the procedure done in London. However, the Irish police warned her that upon return, she could still go to prison. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Ireland, who decided to allow the operation because the girl would otherwise end it all. This, however, was unnecessary as the stress made the girl miscarry. This caused another referendum, which allowed the procedure to be performed under certain circumstances so this wouldn't happen anymore. In 2012, a woman died of a miscarriage because she was denied the procedure, prompting the protests and new laws to be passed. In 2014, a woman was denied the procedure and went on a hunger strike until it was removed by a C-section. Eventually, in 2018, the country held a nationwide referendum on whether to legalize the procedure, with 66.4% voting in favor of legalization. Ireland is an interesting case because this story plays out across many countries. First, it's made illegal. Something horrible happens to a woman. She wants the procedure anyway. It's not available, so she will go to extreme measures. This eventually comes out, and there is outcry in favor of legalization. One of the most compelling statistics for legalization is that women will undergo the procedure regardless of what the law says. But when it's illegal, those women don't have access to the doctors and medicine needed to do it it in a safe environment and many women will get complications or die. They can't go to a hospital because that would require them admitting to a crime. Chapter 3 Islamic Societies as discussed earlier, Islamic countries were fine with all sorts of family planning for centuries. There are different versions of Islam, but in general, they believed that a soul did not enter the body until 120 days after conception. So according to Islam, it was fine to end a pregnancy in the first 120 days. The Western position was in stark contrast to the Islamic position. Reproductive rights were fiercely debated among Islamic scholars. A landmark change came in 1937. The Egyptian Islamic advisory body concluded that it was okay to end a pregnancy within the first 16 weeks, as long as the procedure didn't put the mother in danger. This position was quickly shared by many imams and became socially and legally acceptable 
normal in many Islamic countries to have the procedure done in the first four months with various restrictions in place, such as only allowing it if the act was forced or with a family member. This made Islamic countries one of the most liberal places for family planning at the time. These laws have remained largely unchanged except for the purposes of population control. Chapter 4. Controlling Women if you want to control your population growth, you need to control women because their womb is the only way to create new human beings. It is for this reason that laws surrounding family planning exist in most countries. Countries will change the legislation surrounding family planning based on how many people the government wants to have. When China in the 1970s had overpopulation, they implemented the one-child policy. Women had to give very personal information about their bodies to the government, were forced to take contraception, and would be forcefully sterilized. Less extreme examples can be found as well. Egypt around the same time would take away a family's child support and limit the jobs women could be hired for if they had too many children. India had an overpopulation problem in the 1960s and 70s and created a culture where having more than two children was bad and where children born outside of marriage were seen as less valuable. Due to the poor healthcare system of India at the time, this caused thousands of people to die from the procedure. And so India set up a committee to legalize the procedure in 1964, accepted its recommendations in 1970, and made it legal in 1971 under nearly any circumstances within the first 20 weeks. On the other hand, countries with a labor shortage do the opposite. Tunisia, for example, had a labor shortage and they legalized nearly all forms of family planning since 1973. But most Islamic countries have banned the procedure under many circumstances. They have therefore found all sorts of Islamic documents to justify this ban. But so have Islamic countries that have legalized it. That is because governments don't actually care about the moral or religious justifications. Whether a country bans or allows different types of family planning is largely political. Whether it will win people's votes to control overpopulation and to control the birth rate. And then they will find all sorts of Islamic texts to justify the things they wanted to do anyway. And these methods of population control are effective. To give a good example of this, let's look at Romania. In 1956, the population had 24 births per 1,000 people. A year later, they liberalized family planning options and the population grew by only 14 births per 1,000 people. 80% of contraceptions were ended artificially. This alarmed the dictatorship and in 1966, they restricted the laws once again and the birth rate went up to 27 births per 1,000 people. These family planning options were so unpopular that when the dictator Ceausescu was overthrown, the first act of the new government was to once again liberalize family planning options. The United States of America the USA is a very ethnically diverse country. For hundreds of years, people from all over the world moved to the USA for slavery, liberty, and opportunity. And they came from all over the world, from Africa, Europe, and Asia. But for most of its history, people of European descent were in charge of the country. In the 19th century, when people moved to the cities to work in factories, they were mostly people of European descent. People in the cities used more family planning options than people in the countryside, because as explained earlier in the video, large families are a burden in the city, but a benefit in the countryside. And many people believed that this would cause minorities to take over the USA because they remained in the countryside and so their populations would grow faster. To quote President Theodore Roosevelt, Willful sterility, the one which the penalty is national death, race suicide. If you've ever wondered why people believe in the Great Replacement Theory, it started as a way to shame women into having more children. And how did the USA decide to handle this fear? Well, by bringing down the fertility rate of minorities through forced sterilization. In the 20th century, forced sterilization became government policy. By 1932, the Eugenics Society boasted that 26 out of the 48 states had passed some sort of mandatory sterilization, with thousands of people surgically prevented from reproducing. 
you know, when we started researching this video, I was not expecting we would be talking about the eugenics society. It wasn't until the 1970s that people realized how widespread it truly was. In 1972, 100 to 200,000 people were forcefully sterilized in the USA. 24% of all Indian women of childbearing age had been sterilized, 20% of all African American women, and 35% of Mexican American women. The USA is a federation of states, where every state can create their own laws independently from the central government, similar to, for example, Australia or Switzerland. So the laws differed from state to state. However, in general, these new laws made ending a pregnancy illegal at any stage of the pregnancy unless it was to save the mother's life. Both the patient and doctor participating in such a procedure were breaking the law. The first change to this came in 1965 in the state of Connecticut. And the animator will show you where that location is on screen right now because I never learned North American geography. Connecticut created a new law that prohibited the use and distribution of all contraceptives. So if you took the pill, you were now breaking the law. This created a strong opposition who took legal action and convinced the Supreme Court of the United States that whether or not a person uses contraceptives is their own personal choice which the government shouldn't get involved in. Eight years later, a similar lawsuit was put before the Supreme Court on whether the government had the right to tell a person whether or not to undergo the procedure. And here too, they decided that a person had the right to privacy about this matter, that the government couldn't tell you to undergo or not undergo the procedure. This meant that not only could you get the procedure, but also that you could not be forcefully sterilized anymore. And this legislation was intact for nearly 50 years. However, the opposition had a clever tactic to still make it illegal and force sterilization onto people. Because, on average, in the United States, minorities were a lot poorer than people of European descent. So the opposition made the argument that the government shouldn't spend money on clinics and that people should pay for it themselves. And, as of 1976, people now had to pay for the clinics. But sterilization was still free. And so, a lot of minorities who couldn't afford the procedure decided to be sterilized instead, essentially performing population control based on skin color without actually calling it that. This is actually a pretty common tactic. In Australia, for example, instead of making the procedure illegal, they made the medicine required to undergo the procedure illegal. Governments tend to find sneaky ways of getting the policies they wanted anyways. This changed in 2022 when the Supreme Court decision was overruled. In most countries, the courts are separate from the political system. For example, the highest courts in many countries have their judges chosen by other judges. This way, the political system cannot influence the decision-making process of judges. In the USA, however, the courts are a deeply political organization where judges are chosen based on political alignment by the politicians. And under the Trump administration, the US Supreme Court was filled with judges who opposed the legalization of the procedure. And in 2022, they decided that it was now okay for individual states to make it illegal again. Chapter 6. Latin America the debate regarding family planning and whether to make it legal or illegal started in the early 20th century. At this time, motherhood was framed as a nationalist issue, meaning that it was a person's duty to their country to produce children. At the time, the more people a country had, the more powerful that country would be. So it was the duty of mothers, doctors and politicians to make sure the country had more people. And if they failed, then a neighboring country with a larger population would eventually take them over. Having children was framed as a matter of national security. But just as the USA, some people were deemed more valuable than others, such as people of European descent. Male doctors supported authoritarian family welfare. This meant that minority women could have their child forcefully taken away, be forcefully sterilized, or be forced to undergo the procedure. And because of this racism, the feminist movement regarding family planning was split into two broad categories. Those of minority women and those of majority women, each fighting for their own issues. 
But because of the nationalism surrounding parenthood, very few were in favor of allowing the procedure. Majority women focused on improving education regarding reproduction, while many minority women fought for the rights to raise their own child instead of the state taking it away from them. This was framed as child rights, that a child had the right to have loving parents. By framing minority mothers' issues as children's issues, they managed to convince enough people to allow them to keep their children. The first country to actually legalize the procedure was Cuba, and they did so for the same reason as many other Soviet-style communist countries. They wanted to show how liberal they were compared to capitalist nations. It would take another 30 years before a second country allowed the procedure outside of life-threatening situations as well. Guyana in 1995. Uruguay tried decriminalizing the procedure in 2008, but the president vetoed the new law. The opposition argued that they should focus on adoption instead of the procedure. But people tried again in 2012 with a new president, and this time it succeeded. And from here, the process appears to be accelerating. In Argentina, during the 2010s, people protested against the ban by wearing green bandanas, which represented health, therefore framing the movement as a health issue. In 2018, a new law was discussed that would have legalized it in the first 14 weeks, but it didn't pass the Senate, even though a majority of the population supported this new law. In 2019, the country elected a president who supported legalization. And finally, on January 24, 2021, Argentina legalized it, and the procedure was accessible for free for everyone. Argentina's success spurred other countries to do the same. In Mexico, for example, only 4 out of the 31 states allowed the procedure in 2007 plus Mexico City, followed by another one in 2019 and two more in 2021. In response, other states imposed far stricter laws banning women access to the procedure until the issue was put before Mexico's Supreme Court, who ruled that the procedure was a fundamental human right and that a ban will only harm the poorest people in society. This caused the remaining states to change their own laws regarding family planning, and in 2021, five more states allowed the procedure. The most recent country to legalize the procedure, however, is Colombia in 2022. They had first outlawed the procedure all the way back in 1936, and since the 1970s, there have been attempts to legalize it on a national level. As the power of the Catholic Church decreased, the public opinion became more and more in favor of legalizing the procedure. In 2006, the country's courts ruled that the ban was a violation of women's rights and stopped penalizing people for performing or having the procedure done to them if it caused a serious health risk, birth defects, or if the act was non-consensual, until in 2022, it was finally legalized. Yet some countries have also restricted women's access as well. Nicaragua banned the procedure under all circumstances in 2006, while in 2021, Honduras created a law stating that if they ever wanted to legalize it, 75% of Congress needed to agree to it, meaning that even if there was a majority, they still wouldn't be able to pass the law. Chapter 7. The Rest of Asia We've already talked about Central Asia by talking about the former Soviet Union countries and have talked about the Islamic countries, but there are some we haven't looked at properly yet. One such country is China. When the Communist Party took over China, they realized that their population was growing very fast, and so they wanted to lower the birth rate. In the 1950s, they used equal rights for women, because when women have a career, they tend to have fewer children. Where in most countries, women's rights started with women, in China, it started as a government tool to control the birth rate. But China was poor, and many people were starving. And people who are poor and starving find it difficult to start a career, and so this tactic failed. In 1979, they implemented the one-child policy, where a woman was allowed to have only one child, unless their first child was a girl, then a second birth was permitted. A government official then came over to congratulate the woman on the birth of their child and forced them to promise to never have children again. Six months later, they would receive a letter saying they had to go to the local hospital where they would be forced to have some sort of family planning done to them, each of which brought health risks with them. By 1995, about 10% of China's rural women suffered from some sort of health problem because of it. 
China's birth rate did go down from 2.8 children in 1979 to just 1.6 in 2015 when the policy was abolished. At least for ethnically Han Chinese, if you are a minority, these policies are still in effect. Then China had the opposite problem. They did not have enough children. And so today, China is going in the opposite direction and is restricting all forms of family planning. It's even trying to shame women who focus on careers. Just like in Latin America, they're trying to turn parenthood into a national duty. And that China might not become a superpower if women don't do their part. Although such shaming techniques don't seem to work at all. Chapter 8 Africa Africa largely adopted the laws of their former colonizers. But because these laws were created in the early 20th century, this meant that many of these countries still have restrictive laws. It's only in the 21st century that most African countries decided the procedure is okay if it preserves the life and health of the mother instead of outright banning it under all circumstances. But that said, there are still many countries where it's completely illegal, such as Madagascar, Sierra Leone, or the Republic of Congo. For most African countries, their laws have barely changed at all since they were colonized, except that many of them will now allow it to save the person's life or if the act was forced. And for several countries, even if it was legalized, it wouldn't matter that much because medical facilities are virtually non-existent. An example of this is Guinea-Bissau, where it's technically legal since 1993, but there are barely any medical facilities in the country to begin with, meaning people have to find traditional additional methods of performing the procedure, which governments have a hard time regulating in the first place. And this is a story that takes place all over Africa. A notable exception is South Africa, which legalized it in 1997. It's interesting because it was illegal before then. However, the country had very close ties with the Netherlands and Great Britain, two of its former colonizers, and people would travel there to undergo the procedure. But because of the large amount of discrimination in South Africa itself, this option was only available to people of European descent. Native South Africans rarely had this opportunity which was honestly a weird decision because the official policy of South Africa was to reduce the native population. To quote Prime Minister B.J. Forster, We would like to reduce them, and we are doing our best to do so. And yet they somehow refused to legalize the procedure. When the country ended apartheid in the 1990s, it wanted to give the native population the ability to choose when to get pregnant. And so, in 1997, they legalized it. Chapter 9 RU486 RU486 was a pill developed in France so a person could undergo the procedure without having to go to a clinic. It was first sold in France in 1987. However, there was a very strong opposition to this pill. Clinics had thus far been the best way to control who could and could not have the procedure done. People could protest in front of those clinics, intimidate the people working there, or cut their funding. But with a pill, it became a lot harder to oppose the procedure. So they put pressure on the company who developed it until that company stopped production. The French government, however, had a special law that allowed them to take the copyright of medicine away from a company if that company refuses to sell it. So if, for example, I sold a medicine for a rare disease and it wasn't profitable anymore, once I take that medicine off the market, the French government could force me to hand over the copyright. And that's exactly what they did. And it's a lot harder to pressure the French government with protests because they are used to it already. And so the pill remained available in France free of charge. And in countries where the procedure was legalized, so too was this pill. Today, it has become the most popular version of undergoing the procedure. And this was the history of female reproductive rights. And if you like this video, then please give it a like and subscribe for more content. And if you want to see these videos a week early, then you can go to our Patreon. Link is in the description. This was Avery from History Scope. Thank you for watching.